I want to talk to you today from a place of grace. Please know that God knows the struggle you're facing. Your walk with God really means everything to you. You know he's poured out his love, mercy, and grace through his son Jesus on the cross. The Holy Spirit dwells within you, guiding, correcting, and filling your life with joy and peace. You feel like you owe him everything, perhaps even your own life. But now in this moment, you feel like you've failed him. I get it. Maybe you've sinned in a way that seems unforgivable, and now in your heart, you hear that condemning voice. How could you? Some Christian you are. You feel that weight pressing on your chest, and the thought lingers. This time is different. I've gone too far. Well, let me tell you right now, that voice is not from God. The enemy of your soul loves to whisper lies and remind you of your failures. But the truth is that God's word is a healing balm, a soothing ointment for our brokenness and shame. Yes, sin leaves scars, but condemnation doesn't have to be your reality. Romans 8.1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. No condemnation. That's the promise. And Jesus has set you free. You are no longer bound by the law of sin and death, but by the law of the Spirit that gives life. You'll see that in Romans 8 too. The prison doors of guilt have been swung wide open. You are free to go. You are God's masterpiece. Ephesians 2.10 He created you with love and purpose to walk with Him every step of your life. And yes, he knows when you've sinned, but his love isn't conditional on your performance. Instead, God's love reaches out through the sacrifice of his son, bridging the gap between his holiness and our sinfulness. And this is what John 3.16 tells us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And if that wasn't clear enough, look at John 3, 17. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So Jesus didn't come to point fingers at us. He came to save us from the very sin we're ashamed of. I want you to picture the story of the prodigal son from Luke 15. The son took his inheritance, wasted it all, and found himself in the pit. He felt he had let his father down beyond repair. But when he returned home with a repentant heart, his father, representing God, ran to him, embraced him, and threw a feast to celebrate his return. That's how our God responds when we come to him with our broken hearts. No matter how far you think you've strayed, God is waiting with open arms. Luke 15, 20 says, But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. This is God's response to us. He doesn't stand at a distance with his arms crossed. He runs toward us, full of love and grace. Repentance, as Acts 3.19 tells us, brings restoration and refreshment. Repent ye, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. When we turn to God in repentance, He wipes our sins away, and He brings us into a place of spiritual renewal. Think for a moment about Peter, the very disciple who boldly proclaimed he would never deny Jesus, ended up denying him three times in a single night. Matthew 26, 74 to 75 says, Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, 
I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. Peter was crushed by his failure, but Jesus didn't cast him aside. After the resurrection, Peter became a leader in the early church, transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, God knows the raw material he's working with <laughs> in each of us. But he also sees the masterpiece we can become by his grace. Remember what God told Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. It's in our moments of weakness, when we think we've let God down the most, that his strength shines, the brightest. God doesn't discard us when we mess up. Instead, he uses our failures as opportunities for his grace and power to be displayed. Feeling like you've let God down is a battle within your heart and mind. But Romans 12, 2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good, and acceptable, and perfect will of God. And when you renew your mind with God's truth, you start to see things from His perspective, not the world's. And as you navigate through this struggle, Galatians 6, 2 reminds us, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. You don't have to carry this weight alone. Lean on your brothers and sisters in Christ. Let them walk with you through this season of feeling overwhelmed by guilt. And finally, Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, he hath made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he hath set the world in their heart, so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. Even in your perceived failures, God is shaping you into something beautiful. Trust his timing. Trust his process. When you think you've let God down, remember this. His plans for you are still good. Jeremiah 29 11 says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. God's plans for your life are not dependent on your perfection. His love is unshakable and His grace is unfathomable. <laughs>